Good evening, all. Wow, voice of God, there we go. Um, uh, I'm Clayton Rose, I'm the president of the college, and it is a great pleasure to have everyone here tonight. Uh, this is a very special evening for the college, a very special evening in the literary annals of Bowdoin. Uh, we have always been a gathering place for writers of national and global renown, beginning, of course, with Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but continuing through the contemporary, We've been visited by such luminaries as Nicole Hannah-Jones, Colm Toibin, the Nobel laureates Seamus Haney, and Mario um, Vargas Llosa. And this evening, it is our honor to, host two, to both host and to welcome to Bowdoin two of the most esteemed and celebrated authors in the English language. If, as the Nobel laureate Cheswa Milo said, language is the only homeland, then tonight we are truly at home. In the houses that are constructed by the two masters of our language, each time they write, they reveal the world and our own experiences to each of us anew and allow us to better understand who and where we are. John Banville was born in 1945 in Wexford, Ireland, and he has been described as the true heir to Proust and Nabokov. He stands as one of the finest prose stylists in our language, Reading Banville, we are startled by his imagining of the imaginations of personages as grand as Kepler and Copernicus, or as local and everyday as a teenage boy with a crush on his best friend's mother. Banville writes with a precision that is truly mind-boggling, liming the emotions and the state of mind of his characters with a precision that makes us feel that their mental, pro that their mental processes are our own. His novels include the Book of Evidence, The Sea and the Infinities, his latest publications of the novels, Mrs. Osmond and Time Pieces, a Dublin memoir. He is the recipient of the Mann Booker Prize, the Austrian State Prize for Literature, the Kafka Prize, and the Prince of Austria's Award, and he has regularly been shortlisted for the Nobel Prize. He has a fascinating side gig with the pseudonym Benjamin Black. He is a crime thriller writer, and his latest uh, is a book, The Wolf on a String, at least a fan here. He is a screenwriter, a playwriter, and a book reviewer, and lives in Dublin. Richard Ford, born in 1944 in Jackson, Mississippi, perhaps the most decorated of living American writers, having received too many prizes to count, but among them, the Pulitzer and the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. And he's achieved that rarest of feats, the trifecta. His work is held in the highest esteem by other writers. He's of ever-growing interest and important to critics and scholars and he is beloved by lay readers and students around the world. Reading forward, we come to see that there is much poetry in the often mocked suburban wastelands of New Jersey. I thank you for that, having raised our children there. As there is in the Rocky Mountain National Park, and speaking of the Rockies, he is claimed as a second landscape, as truly his own, the desolate reaches of northern Montana, another love that we learned we both share this evening. Roth had Newark. Updike had Old Dutch Pennsylvania, Faulkner had Ford's native Mississippi, and Ford has New Jersey and Montana. And if that were his only achievement, it would be singular, but there is, of course, much more. His stories of present-day New Orleans, his consummate skill as a writer of that odd literary form, the novella, and his gorgeous and moving memoir of his parents between them. We are very fortunate tonight to have two such eminent artists in our present, and to have the privilege of listening in on their conversation. And for that, we have to thank our own Anthony Walton, our longtime <laughs> senior writer in residence here at the college, and himself an esteemed poet and author. It is through Anthony that we are here this evening, and for so much more that you have done for so many years at the college, Anthony. Thank you. So with that, please join me in welcoming to Bowdoin College, John Banville and Richard Ford. Thank you. John and I were trying to decide who was going to help who up those stairs. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to help you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, 
since this is the Nobel season and neither of us is watching the telephone, uh, maybe you are, I'm not. Uh, uh, well, no, we can't, we, we can't because th the last one they gave was to a, a white prose fiction writer. Who was that? Kazuo Ishiguro. Oh, uh, that's Ish, our pal, Ish. Um, Ish yeah, gonna, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm we have no hope. I was going to ask you, uh, just because just we've talked about this a little bit once before, um, um, how do you feel about Bob Dylan winning the Nobel? You, you on with that? I thought it was absolutely ridiculous, and <laughs> uh, I was horrified. Were you really? Yeah. I mean, there are lots of prizes for millionaire rock stars. Uh, you know. But I, I guess I thought, well, hell, it's their prize, and they can give to whoever they, whoever they want. Yeah, well, look what they did with it. Well, they, they made a lot worse mistakes than, yeah. than Bob, seems to me. Well, they screwed the whole thing up by corrupting it. I better stop. They're probably oh, no, listen, no, this, no, this, they're, this, they're this, probably no, this listening. is no, this is good. I, that's, this, this, this is what we're aiming at. We're aiming at controversy here. Yeah, I mean, it was a big. Con it, you know, we discovered that suddenly, the Nobel that was supposed to be absolutely pure, and incorruptible. When was that? About three years. Well, was that, when, was that when, before when was after Pearl Buck won? Ah, I don't know. Well, somebody told me recently that Pearl Buck's uh, novel about China is very good. See, I never read it. Did you read it? Yes, I did. Did you? Yes. It's not very good. Well, then. I didn't think it was the best book I've read in a long time. <laughs> anyway. But anyway, for God's sake, let's get away from prizes. Oh, no. That's, that's, we, we can make fun of it, though. We're old. We can, we can do that. Uh. <laughs> All right, I asked you a much more serious question. I, I, thought, I, I, I always thought of writing to the Nobel Committee and saying, could I have the money now? Give me the prize some other time, you know. <laughs> you know, Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre, he. he Who didn't win? He, he, he didn't. Did, well, and, he didn't. And he refused it. He refused it. Like and then the following year, he said, uh, I know we refused it last year, but, but could I have the money? And they said, Well, no. <laughs> if you refuse it, you can't have the money. So. You know, when Gore Vidal was, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, he, uh, we, we got the call to say that he'd been elected, and he said, No, he said, I'm already a member of the Diners Club. <laughs> uh, last, last year, um, on a somewhat more serious note, um, la last year I was embarked upon writing a novel, and um, I, wrote a, I wrote maybe the best first chapter I ever wrote in my life. I, I wish I had that, could eat that chapter every day. Um, and the second chapter was slightly less good, and the third chapter was slightly less good than that, and the fourth chapter really just couldn't get off the, couldn't, couldn't get off the ground. And I, and I very happily, with an immense sense of relief, set it aside. And I had never in my life, in 50 years of writing books, and I used to pride myself on this, I'd never set a novel aside before. And I, I always thought that when you did it, it would just be a terrible sense of devastation and sense of loss and failure. But it actually felt wonderful and, and freed me to do something else that I hadn't even imagined. Have you ever set a book aside? No. No, I couldn't do that. <laughs> you I just really couldn't, couldn't do that? No, it would terrify me. I, even if it's, even if it's, I know it's really bad, I would have to try to fix it. it. I would feel that I was falling over a cliff if I put a book aside. Maybe you'd be, maybe you'd feel better if you did that. No, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. So? I, would, I don't, well, maybe I'll try it with the next one. Well, did, did, did you, did you, this is kind of related, interrelated. Um, you, you think, did you tell me last year that you'd taken a book back from your publisher? Did you do that? Uh, well, yeah, that was a bench of black book. That oh. was one of my, my capers. That was of no consequence. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, a, a John Banwood book, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up. Because, you know, it, well, if I'm writing a, a Banwood book, I, this is the project, this is my life. To give it up would be like uh, killing myself. You know, I would be that seems awfully dramatic, though, like killing Yeah, well, it is, but well, it didn't come kill on, me. It didn't Richard. kill me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it killed a small part of you. you know, oh, you know? maybe, well, maybe, uh, maybe that, no, part, I couldn't maybe that part needed to be euthanized. I, do I don't know. Uh, I would, I, I mean, I would have invested so much, not even that. I'm not proposing that you do it. No, no, I understand what you're saying, uh, and it's an interesting question. I... I would have spent so many days, so many weeks, so many months, so many years, scratching away at this thing, 
trying to get it done. If I gave it up, I would be giving up so much of myself that it would be too great a sacrifice. Hmm. And it would be too great a failure. And I don't write in the way that would allow me to give it up. Do you know what I mean? No, no but, I, but I believe it when you say yeah. it. Uh, Still, I'm listening to what you, what you well, say. I'm not, I'm Give not it trying up to propose an out, an easy happy. out for things. It, it, it just shocked me that it didn't make me feel anything but happy. Um, it, it, it isn't even that I thought that I had embarked on a, a bad idea. I think it's actually a good idea, and it's lurking back there in, my, in, in, in a set of notes that I have in those three plus yeah. ch one chapters I might someday return to. But having set it aside, not necessarily abandoned it, just put it aside, I just thought, Okay, maybe I'm just not smart enough yet to write this book. Well, I would never think that. <laughs> I would never. So you think if you can just sort of force it, force it on, force it on. Well, it's interesting what you say. You think you're not smart enough. I always think that I'm much smarter than the books that I write. Do you really think that? Yeah. God, I've never thought that. I always think that you write a book so that you can make something that's smarter than you are. That's no. entirely my, my, so you think you're smarter than the books that you write? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm capable of writing the, the book of the ages. I just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't do it. You know? <laughs> I wish I could, and if I could, I would. But, uh, I mean, I start out with, I don't know, maybe my ego is larger than yours, or maybe my <laughs> self-deception is, is uh, more effective than yours. But I start out a book thinking this will be the one that will set the world back on its heels. This, they forget about Shakespeare, they'll forget about Joyce, they'll forget about Beckett. Uh, this will be the one that will do it. I know in the rational side of my mind that it's, you know, it's just going to be another book. But when I start out, I start out with such high hopes and such high ambitions that uh, if I were to give it up halfway through, I would have betrayed something of myself. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense. It isn't anything I particularly share. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always thinking that a book will be, when I finally finish it, uh, better than I thought its constituent parts could ever end up making it be, so that when I get to the end of it, and I'm, I'm able then to write something which I couldn't have written but that I had written the book itself, I, I, I sometimes glory in the possibility possibilities that are, that, that are suddenly unearthed, that wouldn't have been unearthed had I not written the book. So it always exceeds, it always exceeds my expectations for it to finish a book. Um, does it? Yeah, it really does. No, I feel, I, when I finish a book, I have about an hour and a half of euphoria because I finish the damn thing. I imagine it's like childbirth, you know, God, I've got rid of this thing. Um, but then, Immediately, the sense of despondency and anticlimax sets in. I always feel like finishing a book is, you know, when you, you step on a piece of chewing gum on the pavement and it sticks to your, the sole of your shoe and you, you really have to work hard to get rid of it, you scrape it off the edge of the pavement. That's how I feel about a book. That it's, that this horrible thing is, is I finally got rid of it. And I hate it, I hate it, I hate does, it. Does, does that make you think, and I know I have a feeling about this myself, I'm not a natural writer. I, I'm, I'm Nobody is. Well, maybe that's right, because I certainly am not. I make myself do it because I couldn't think of anything else to do when I started, and, um, and I failed at everything that I was going at to do. And So I thought, well, do this because you haven't failed at it yet. So, um, so it seems to me to be entirely sort of almost atypical of myself to, to, to write books, but you, you feel similarly, do you? No. No, no. T to me, I understand what you're saying. I mean, this is probably the reason that we can be friends, that we're completely different yeah. writers. To me, um, I... You know, I don't know why I write. I, 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 I write in order to exist. I write in order to feel that I'm in some way authentic, hmm. um, that I have some kind of place in the world. If I didn't write, I don't know what I would be. Um, Something less, probably, right? What? Something less, maybe. 
I don't think I would exist at all. I think I would just get, to me, writing has now become the medium that I, it's, it's the medium that I swim in. You know, it's, I'm a fish swimming in, in, in the sea, which is literature. I mean, Kafka said I am literature. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be quite so dramatic as that. I'd say, you know, I am the next book. Uh, but yeah, that's, 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 I, I, I never learned how to live. You know, I never learned how to deal with human beings. I never learned how to deal with, I, I learned to be an actor very early on, you know, from the age of 11 or 12. I realized that I had to perform in order to, to pass as human, you know. Uh, that, you know, that I would fool people, and that I found writing, which was a way of transmuting my, no, a way of, reality for me has to be pressed through the mesh of language before it becomes reality. What is, that's an interesting thing, what is, what is what it is about, about being a, a writer all, all your life, that you're, that you're constantly in, in, I don't want to say fearful because it, not fearful. You just think to yourself, "I'm going to be found out here. I'm going to be found right. out here." It's just, it's just inevitable. Because you, I, th I think partly it is that in, that in the United States there's no real place for a writer. I mean, it's different. It's different for, for you in Ireland. But, but in the United States, there's, there's, there's no real vocation of being a writer that, that is generally sanctioned. Well, it used culture. to be. I mean, well, maybe it used to be when people who wrote in the 19th century may, maybe so. But no, but even but, I mean, in the you know. People like Norman Mailer and Saul yeah. Bellow, they were national figures. Well, Bellow was, uh, and, and Mailer was and less... you're probably the last of them, I'm sorry to say. Well, good. <laughs> that'll, that'll, that'll be fine. Well, it's not good, but... <laughs> Retire the show. It's trophy. good that you're a national figure, but <laughs> it's very sad. <laughs> no, seriously, it's very sad that I suspect that Richard's probably the last of those those emblematic figures who seem to be able to express uh, s something of the national sense of itself. I mean, I, 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 this is one of the things that I, I, I so envy American novelists, that you still have this great topic, which is the making of a nation. Uh, you know, we, we've been around for too long in Europe. We got tired. Yours is still a relatively new country. And your books are part of that nation making, as well as being uh, extremely subtle and beautifully executed works of art. They also have an extension into society, which I don't think European writers feel anymore at all. We're, we're tired. Ours is tired civilization. But don't you think that in 25 years and now, a little, a little time on, that, that people will think about the books that you've, that you've been writing these, these years as, as being the books, a book of their times and a, a book of their places, e even though you don't write about Wexford and you don't, you don't write about Hoth necessarily directly, mm -hmm. you don't write about Dublin, but, but, but almost ipso facto, the books that you write will be the book of the nation that you were a part no, of? No, you don't I think don't so. Think so at all. How could it no. not be? I mean, just, just no, I don't think so because I write uh, out of myself, for myself. I have no, I have no real interest in, in the human concourse. I don't, you know, what I'm trying to do is, is to to write again. My, my old friend John McGowan, he used to he had a wonderful formulation. He said, you know, there's prose and there's verse, and then there's poetry. And poetry can happen in either medium. And John always said, since he was a novelist, and it happens more often in the novel than it does in verse. Um, what I'm trying to do is, I'm consciously trying to make poetry. I think that you make poetry almost as a side effect of writing about I don't mean to be, this sounds patronizing. I don't mean to be that. I'm trying to make a distinction between the kind of writing that you do and the power and the poetic tension of the kind of writing that you do and the, the narrower field in which I work. 
Well, you know, the, at, the, at the beginning of Felix Holt, G George Eliot uh, has a little introduction in which she talks about uh, what is a political novel. So basically what we're talking about is uh, we, we have a, a country here about wh wherein it's possible to write political novels. But what she says is that, that a political novel is a novel that, that demonstrates or displays or, or writes about the effects of history on the individual. And it would, see, it would seem to me that almost no novel that you would be able to write would not in some way comply with that definition, with that directive. That even, though you, even though your intention is different, Others, oh, will read it, others will read it differently. No, I think that's true of your work. That's true of yours. I think it's, it's the great power of your work. But I don't feel that that's it's certainly not what I set out to do. And I'm not sure that that's the effect. But who am I to say? I just write the bloody thing. That's right. And other people read it and, and make the use of it that they make. And, you know, who knows? But what you see, the difference, you see, I'd be horrified to think in 50 years' time my books would be seen as historical documents of their time. I want them to float free. I, I want to strike. I'm not interested in what people do. I'm interested in what people are. I want to strike past mere human activity to get to some essential poetic essence. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, that's what I've spent my life doing. Yours, your work is, is, seems to me, entirely different. Again, as I say, I think they're marvelous poetic achievements, but they start from a different premise. You know? But you know, you really can't tell how a book got written based on the evidence of the book itself. You know, you can't, you can't intuit yeah. what someone's, I mean, you, you can tell me what your intentions are, and then I can tell you what the effect of your intentions are for me as the reader. Yeah. And, and you, you almost can't imagine what, what my intentions are, or, or I yours. I'm just thinking about how the book will, book will be used by subsequent generations of readers, which, which is not so much what I'm talking about, legacy, <laughs> legacy, who cares? But just who, you know, we write for now, we write for our time, we write for people who, who are... No, I don't write for my time. Oh, come on. No, I don't. You, you mean you write for later? No, I just, I don't write for any time at all. I write for myself, and I write to make this object and put it into the world, thing that wasn't there before. And I don't care, I, I have no interest in, 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 as a citizen, as a human being, you know, I vote, I worry about the politics of my time, I, you know, I try to take care of my loved ones, I do all those things that a citizen does. But when I sit down to write, I have no interest in any of that, none. So when you finish it, the, the whole sense of completion and satisfaction is, is, is the degree to which it imbues you with something, not the degree to which you might think to yourself. I don't, I don't get any satisfaction. As I say, I get an hour and a half of euphoria, and then, well, I, euphoria then, the, disgust, then the disgust sets in. And I really, it's not, you know, I mean, I've, I feel disgust because I've, everything I set out to do, no, not everything, the thing I set out to achieve I have not achieved, because that would be perfection. And we can't have perfection. So I keep pressing on, trying to get it right. Uh, I know I will never get it right, but I start off in the state of euphoria that, you know, this time I will get it right. Knowing I won't, this is how, this is how, I, how I work. I guess I'm different because I came, to, I came to being a writer from being a reader and from imitating something um, that well, I... Well, they all did, of yeah, course. Yeah, sure. But, but, but now, as we, was, as we were saying yesterday, now I, I, I think, long years after whatever were my first intentions, now I think if I didn't have a sense of an, an audience who would, who would find some use for my book, I wouldn't bother to write them. I would I'd find something easier to do or more funsy to do. Or again, I think maybe this is an essential difference in you and me. Well, I'm sure I, it is. I don't care. I, I really don't care. Um, and I never did. Um, but you read books all the time, and so you, you, you read books, and so you <coughs> care about the books that you read, and you write about them wonderfully, and you, and you are, are one of the most intuitive, at the same time scholarly, writers about books of anybody I know. So there must be, s it would seem to be some natural carryover between 
how you are and react as a reader to how you are and react to the world as a writer. Oh, no, the person, the, the, the reviewer who reviews books, I review a book, I'm completely separate from the person who writes them. No, but I mean, you are, but you are a reader. For, it, fundamentally, you are a reader. You yeah, read, but I don't quite books. understand the point you're making. I mean, what, of course, writers are made out of readers. Mm -hmm. Uh, we start by reading, and we want to write, as, as you said, uh, we want to write the kind of books that we like. And if, of course, I, I, I do that. But the process becomes for me so convoluted and so, so separated from anything in my life that it's this horrible monster that I'm dealing with. There's a wonderful passage in uh, William Gaddis's. Uh, Yes, one of his books when he says, you know, you come in in the morning and, and the invalid is still sitting there in the wheelchair and you wheel it out into the light and you change its bandages and you say, how are you? And he's talking about writing. That's how I feel. Every morning this thing, this horrible thing is still sitting there. And I, every morning I don't know, I, I'm sure you have the same sensation, I don't know how to do it. I, I look at the page, I think, I, I don't know how I did this yesterday. How am I to, you know, where, where am I to start? What am I to do? Uh, and then I fiddle around and I write a few words and eventually I sink. I wonder if you have this sensation. I start work, you know, I work at office hours, work 9 to, nine to 6, 6.30. Uh, with a very short break in the middle, which I don't even notice what I'm eating or what I'm doing. Um, and when I start in the morning, I don't know how to do it. I, I, I have to push myself to do it. But by about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I have sunk so far into myself that I don't exist anymore. I've ceased to exist. At some strange level, the words themselves, the sentences, they have taken over, and I have ceased to exist. So that when people say to me, you know, when interviewers say, you know, something about John Bamford, I always say, that John Bamford doesn't exist. The person you're talking to is not the person who wrote those books. Oh, no, I, I, when I, stand, I completely, stand, I completely yeah. understand that. Yeah. But so, so but I mean, how? It just, it just, why, why are we differing, then? That's what we're paid to do. <laughs> <laughs> but no, maybe, it's no, because you, maybe it's because you never had Ralph Waldo Emerson in, in Ireland. You know, it's, it's somebody else. Because it's kind of slightly romanticized view of, of the artist which, who immolates himself in, in his work is, is, is so sort of un-Emersonian in, in, in a sense, and having that as my text when I was young. Oh, I yeah, I mean, we're, we're both great admirers of Emerson. Yeah. I mean, I think one of, one of the, the great... Uh, and one of the things I like about Emerson is he's so anti-intellectual. Right. You know, he's saying, you know, uh, we live in the world. Right. Um, and we have to live in the world. But he writes so beautifully. Yes, and he's a very practical, practical, uh, yeah. practical boy, and, uh, and writing those essays mostly. I, oh. I stole a, a, a line from Emerson, a uh, beautiful line. He says, a man is a god in ruins. And I put it into one of my books, and I forgot to put it in italic. And apparently, a lot of the reviewers said, this is one of the most beautiful sentences Bamber has ever <laughs> written. So I've decided, you know, I just, I, I just hide, uh, and we steal, we steal, of course, from from other writers, as we should. Absolutely, I would, I would like. Well, to you think steal when you don't steal. when you don't know you're stealing. In fact, I was reading. You. I was reading a uh, uh, W. G. Zewald uh, book years ago, and I came across one of my sentences in, in the book. <laughs> first of all, I thought, what an amazing coincidence! And I thought, no, he stole it from me. <laughs> and then I thought, wonderful. How did you feel about that? Did you, did you, feel, did you, did you say mine, mine, mine? No, what? no, no. I thought wonderful. You know, I, it was good enough to steal. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was quite a nice sentence. Uh, <laughs> do you, um, you know, after after we've been doing this now for fifty years, um, do, do you feel differently uh, from the as a writer from the way you felt when you were when you were a boy? I mean, uh, other than just in pain all the time and um, self-immolating and out of sorts. No, well, that's what I said earlier. I still don't know how to do it. I don't know how I did it yesterday. I don't know how I, 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 
but it's, it's basically just a, rep a replication of the way you felt when you started. No, it's always new. I mean, it's it's well, that's what I'm it's asking. always an, am an amazement. It's every morning I sit down and I'm working. I think, why did I start this foolish project? And how did I do it yesterday? I, I just I'm I'm baffled in front of this because language is so treacherous. Uh, language wants to. I mean, you know we. I always say we imagine we speak, but in fact we are spoken. Say, you know, that, again. Now, say, say that again, I don't understand that. I think that language is, we think that we're, as Oscar Wilde said, lords of language. No, language lords it over us. I, don't, I have no idea what you mean by that. I really, I mean, I'm, no? it sounds, sounds intelligible. Well, okay, you, Anybody, you sit down, and let's forget about being novelists. You sit down, you write a letter to your, your lover uh, or your bank manager. And <laughs> when you finish the letter, you read it over, and you think, oh, that's not quite what I meant to say. Who speaks here? And who speaks there, there is language. It is, it, it, it's, always, it's always subverting us. It's always pushing us aside from what we thought we wanted to say. Don't you feel that? Well, but That's I think the whole notion of authorship means that uh, ultimately, even though those little ways in which I, I get what you mean about language pushing us to the side, that, that we have to reassert our authorship to be able to make it uh, communicative, to be able to take responsibility for it. I mean, authorship to me means that you authorize every single thing, and, and maybe in the process of putting a sentence down, th the sentence may, may move you in ways that you didn't think you wanted to go, but ultimately you have to just take responsibility for it, and, and it it's kind of works out the same. Well, I put it this way, that I feel, where language is concerned, I feel like Jacob and the angel. I'm constantly battling with this thing, I'm wrestling with this thing, and I know it's going to leave me with a, with a limp. You know, uh, I don't mind the limp. I like the notion that the angel will will somehow express for me what I wanted to say, or some version of what I wanted to say. God, you're such a romantic about this. I, I know. I'm it's completely. It's I'm a 19th century unreconstructed it's romantic. Un un unbelievable. Hopeless. Ah, well, not hopeless. Obviously, here you are. Um, not hopeless at all. I mean, it's so different for me. I, I, you know, I understand exactly what you mean about language pushing you around, baffling you here, baffling you there. But when, when, it, when, when you finally uh, take responsibility for what you're doing, I have such a sense of triumph. I have such a sense of, gee, I don't know where this came from, but it's, I really love it. I'm interested I, wouldn't, I wouldn't live with it if I didn't love it. Yeah, I'm interested in your use of the word responsibility. I, that fascinates me. I, I, that never occurred to me before. Language always seems to me to be. When, you know, I grew up as a Catholic, and we were told about the guardian angel. The guard, it, every person has a guardian angel. This terrified me. This notion of this enormous, white clad, androgynous figure with these folded wings at his back or its back, watching me in everything I did terrified me. That's how I feel about language. Language is constantly saying, I am greater than you, I know more than you, I'm older than you, I am immortal, and you're trying to push me around here. Yeah. So in other words, and, and I have to find other words because I can't <laughs> take those, <laughs> but, but um, you sort of, in a way of talking, as, as if you sort of you were you, you were moved by forces greater than yourself. Is that is that yes. does that seem apt? Oh yeah. I mean, language is, is is apart from anything else, language, you know, the tribe has been using it right. for millennia. And the words are at once worn worn down by usage, but they're also extraordinarily rich with the tradition. You know, I mean, I'm constantly discovering 
new words. I'm constantly discovering that I, I, I'll give you an example. When I was writing that Henry James book, the, the Mrs. Osmond, and I wrote in a sort of state of trance, and there was a point at which he was talking about he was being fed vegetarian food by somebody, and uh, you see what I say? He, not I. He was writing, and he was saying, uh, he said, you know, at least the salad had escaped the ebullient cauldron, right? I didn't know that ebullient meant boiling. Hmm. I had to look it up. Hmm. So who knew, who was it that wrote the ebullient cauldron? It wasn't Henry James, it wasn't me. It was language. Language came to my aid from deep, deep down somewhere in me, in the collective unconscious. I'm not a Jungian, but somewhere, from somewhere that word came up, and it served me when I needed it. You know what I mean? Oh, I know what you mean. I just, don't, I just can't live with it. I just, because, and I, and I think it's probably one of my limitations as a writer that I, that, that I can't, I, I couldn't consign actively consign responsibility for the source of the word ebullient to some nether world of, of, of where, where language is bubbling. But I'm telling you, I didn't know what it meant until well I looked that's it up the dictionary. You're, you're telling and me And then that. I discovered I, that it was the right word, Well, because it means boiling. I would have just said you wrote it, and, you've, and you came upon it by accident, and you decided to lay claim to it. Well, you see, this goes back to the beginning of our conversation. Right. I think there's a difference between American and European right. We're at the end of a tradition. We're, at the, we're just picking up the bits and pieces. I remember the first time I went to the, the capital in Rome, and I thought, this is European civilization. All this stuff lying around uh, that we could pick up and, and use and not use. Whereas America is still making itself. You know, it's still, you're, you're still making a nation. Making a civilization, our civilization is, 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 is at an end. Oh, God, I just can't think in those terms. It just, just doesn't seem right to me. I mean, it, it might be right for us, but almost none of us would say that. But I, I just can't think that it's not right for you and somebody writing in Uzbekistan or somebody who's writing in Scandinavia. I just, I just yeah, can't. Yeah, but I'm not from Scandinavia. No, I'm no, you're Pakistan, not, but you're talking so about Europe. As if Europe were a place, but I mean, Ireland's not even Europe. Ireland's just Ireland. And you're making <laughs> yeah, it. that's true. <laughs> Ireland isn't even Europe. I mean, you're kind of making it all. You're kind of making it up as you go along. It seems to me. I mean, I mean, I mean, Ireland. Anyways, you're making Ireland up as you go along. Yeah. Is it time to throw it up? Are you tired of this conversation? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> by it. It's it, in a way, it's too fascinating. It's too dense. I think. You know, I don't know. It's just, we have to pretend that we're serious. How is you dangerous? Well, serious? maybe I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm perhaps too serious about it. No, I it's the most serious thing. In the, it's the most serious thing in the world. Yeah. So, if there's anything you can teach students, who are any people such as we are, can teach students, it is that we think that this thing that we're doing is the most serious thing that we could possibly do. And it's not embarrassing to say so. Yeah. It's, you know, you know that line of, of we're all, you, you and I were talking about, sure, well, yes, it's just, it may not be a good idea, but none, none that. We're not, we're not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that line, of, you, you, you and I are, are fans of Cyril Connolly to some extent, because he's a very quotable guy. Yeah. And one of the things Connolly says in The Unquiet Grave, he says, uh, the only true function of a writer is to write a masterpiece, which is yeah. one of the great memorable lines that anybody ever wrote. And, and, and I say this, I, I ask whenever I have students, I always say there are two things I want you to, to, to know. I want you to know that, that there's no true function of a writer except to write a masterpiece. And why not? What else is worthwhile? And the other thing is to, to have a definition in your mind of what you think great literature is. And, and whether you can articulate it or not, and it helps to be able to articulate it. I mean, I have one, and, and probably someplace in in that nether world, you have one as you have one as well. Oh yes, I have. Yes. Of course, I have. Um, Leave us this great line: "Literature is the supreme means by which we renew our sensuous and emotional life and learn a new awareness." Yeah, yeah. So bingo, you know. I, yeah, sort of covers the ground. So we're in, a, we're in agreement at last. Ah, what a what a 
So maybe right. this is the moment to. All right, maybe this is the moment to hand it over to you. Well, that's no that's, good. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. What, aren't my plants in the audience ready to say something? And Billy, there's no point in coming to us afterwards and saying, <laughs> I wanted to ask. Ask yeah. it now. Yes. Mm-hmm. We'll be nicer to you than we are to each other. OK. Please, uh, sir. Good question. Well, it's a very, really, really good. It's a really good question because yeah. you can't say, "Oh, nothing," but but there is, at least in my life, there is a sense of a of, of, a, of, a, of a, a lifetime drawdown of of available material that seemed apt to be, to be used to, to, for whatever I wanted to use it for. And what you have to hope is that, and this is the optimistic part of it, at least for me, that 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 you draw that bucket down to the bottom of all of the things that you would. You know, thought cumulatively you could write about, and it is only then that you get to the good stuff. But that's pure optimism. Yeah, I. I it is an interesting question. I think that the artist, the, the, the writer, just has one work, and he or she spends his or God, I wish we could come up with a new pronoun. Uh, the artist spends its life doing the same thing over and over again and trying to get it right, trying to get it. You mean one basic refined. project? Yeah, yeah, I think. Never thought. You about know, of that. course, it's you know the, the the content is varied and you know the styles are varied. I mean, Richard's Canada. One of the things that, that astonished me when it came out was how different it was in style to the Frank Bascom books. Um, but yet, it's, it's, it's all part of a project. You know, I, I envision <laughs> my books someday in one enormous volume, you know, and possibly the, the bookbinder's impossibility, you know, it's about a foot long, and it's all uh, it's all there on 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 the, the the shelf. It's all one project. Every book I write is a ref- an attempt at a refinement of the previous book. I, I, I don't think that's true. Y- yes, y- well, is it? no, no. It's it's not that I don't think it's true. I've just never said that before. But you've said it now. Now I have to think about it because it. Because it, it does make a kind of sense to me. I mean, I, I generally believe that, that I, and I think you might even agree with this, I, I, don't, have a, I don't have what I think of as a character. I, I don't, as a human being, I don't think I contain a, an Emersonian mass in, in my middle. And the only evidence of me is this thing that I've done. And, and that may be collectively able to be thought of as one thing, one, one body of hmm. effort. And so in that, it may be the only evidence of me that there is. I mean, this is, this is navel-gazing to the profoundest extent. But no, it's not really. Well, no. But I just, interest, it interests me what, what, what you said. Uh, but I mean, one, thing, you, you, one thing about how what you did influences what you subsequently do, I, I think everybody's trying to get better. Um, and, and, and we were talking about this line of Cromwell's, and which Cromwell was reputed, reported to have said that unless you're getting better, you're not good. And, and, and in one way, the only sense of goodness that I have outside of who I'm married to is, is something good that I do, something good that I make. And you can define good however you want to. So, you, yeah. so, so, so whatever you've done, in a way, lifts you toward the thing that is next, and maybe you can make it a little better. But let, let's go back just for a moment to what you said about the self. I've never felt that, that I have a self. Me, me either, ever. Uh, Zero. And I suspect most people. Fearful. Fear that they don't. D- don't. We you just know, make a living out I of it. I mean, re- religion, religion, and, and I was brought up in a very strict religion, taught me that I had a soul. And the soul is like this pilot light in your oven. You know, it's always on, it's always lighting there. Um, and one day in my teenage year, I realized that there is no pilot light. There's <laughs> nobody in there. <laughs> and that I remake myself at every moment. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes life 
fascinating. Imagine if we were all the same all the time. It would be dreadfully boring. Uh, we, we make ourselves, we fashion ourselves to the moment. You know, as Eliot says, I, I, what is it? You, to make a face to meet the faces that you meet, or whatever. And this is what we do. But that's wonderful. I yeah. mean, I would hate to have a self. Me too. I like the notion that, that and this is one of the, this is one of the great uh, gifts that, that, uh, that's been given to writers, that we can try out all kinds of new selves. It's like dreaming 24 hours a day. You know, in a way, a novel is a, c a controlled dream. Uh, you, you know, when you're asleep and you, you you meet these people that you've never seen before, and they say all these amazing things to you, and you you wake in the morning exhausted from from this from, from this fantasy, from this fiction that your mind has made for you. We uh, spend our days uh, dreaming, but dreaming in a controlled way. That's, don't you think that's true? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. I, though I don't, the, the, I'm so suspicious of dreams. It's such an anti Freudian. and I try to, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is spend 10 minutes trying to forget everything I have dreamed. So I don't want to, oh I don't yeah, want, no, I don't no, want no, to no, no, be no, visited no, by my dreams in, in any conceivable we're way. Both, we're both anti Freudians, <laughs> I, 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 I don't believe. But, but, but we do dream. Yeah. But, but one of the yeah. things I always try to say to people who want to write novels is that there's something basically plausible about writing novels. In, in, in the Ruskin sense that, that, that uh, Ruskin says composition is the arrangement of, of unequal things, no. which, it is, which is true about composition. Mm -hmm. Things that haven't gone together before are made to go together and then you make a form out of it. Mm -hmm. It's very much like the way we live. We make our lives up out of things that don't go together and try to make them plausible, make ourselves plausible by doing it. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, something sort of apposite to writing, making yeah. whatever it is. As you said, so, so that we'll, we'll we get away with it, Jules Lenard in his, in his journals. He's a wonderful line where he says, every evening I fall to my knees by my bedside. And I join my hands and I say, thank you, Lord, for letting me get through one more day without being found out. <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it's wonderful. Anyway, uh, any more any questions? Any other questions, please. Come on. Yes? Y y this young man and then we'll come back. What? Please. There's a, the, I'm There's sorry, but, but I, can't see, I can't see that far. Um, what would you have written uh, about the time period? Uh, yes. Uh, John, well, John has this wonderful novel called Time Pieces, which is about yeah. leaving Westford and going to. Yeah. Come on. Um, I, 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 th I think, s I think, so. I mean, inevitably it would, wouldn't it, in some ways, in some just commonsensical way, but, but when, when you, when I hear you ask that question, I, I, I think about, um, I, I think about a, a poem of Seamus's, which is called Harvest Bow, and Harvest Bow is a wonderful little poem, and it, it has the wonderful line toward the end of it, which is that the end of art is peace. And he, he, he just means that, he, he, by the piece he means is the, is the is sort of interlinear piece that the, that, that the poem achieves, or that the piece of art achieves. And, and I think the thing that made me write about my parents was that even though it was a turbulent life in lots of ways, that um, we loved each other and that we made a, we, we made a piece out of life uh, by virtue of loving each other and by effort. Uh, which tr which transcended the what the pieces that didn't fit together very well that did that, that that were turbulent that that were irregular and that and that didn't go together and um, I mean and, and so I, I think that was an impulse that I learned I mean I'm, I'm a person who tries to think of everything as fairly normal I want things to be normal even when there's not a lot of evidence that that normality is is incumbent in the in the details, I, I want things to be normal, and I think, I think that influenced me a lot. 
Mm. See, I thought that your, your memoir was, of your parents was um, wonderfully moving. And I think that it was absolutely true. Um, true in this, uh, sorry, not true. True to life, true to the facts that you were trying to to get as close mm -hmm. to what happened to in, in Lowen's life, you know, why not say what happened? Right. I would not be able to write like that. Uh, my little memoir uh, timepieces is is about me, uh, and everything else is incidental. You know, the ego is still spinning there in the middle of it, like this horrible. Those things that in the old science fiction movies, there was always something <laughs> yeah, spinning, spinning in the middle of a, you know, a, a glow, you know, a horrible light. The ego uh, is there. I never. Well, I shouldn't be too hard on myself. I didn't love my parents when they were alive. Um, they bored me. They annoyed me. Um, I wanted them to be gone. Uh, they conveniently went when I was in my 30s. Um, and then afterwards, I suppose, I felt... Guilt is too strong a word, but I felt that I hadn't fulfilled my responsibilities towards them. Um, but I, could, I would not be capable of writing the kind of book that Richard wrote. I was not interested in, in them enough. And that's, I mean, this is a, a, a scourge with which I, you know, I beat myself uh, rightly. Um, but I, I wouldn't know how to, I, what I'm saying is quite, I wouldn't know how to write a memoir because I don't know what the past was. I don't know what reality was when I was there. Sorry, it's a long, incoherent, useless reply to a good question. You had a question, young man. Well, I couldn't write in any other language. Um, I would love to be able to write in German, and, you know, one of the most beautiful languages, but I couldn't do it. So, but you know, in a way, the English language is not specific. That's the glory of it. Right. It's such a, yeah. a filthy, uh, mongrelized uh, language. Yeah, language. yeah, it's 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 totally corrupted, which makes it wonderful. Um, and you know, Shakespeare made so much of it. I mean, Shakespeare invented 2,000 words uh, that we all think you know, were there before him, but he, he made them up. And at that time, it was wonderful that the language was white hot because all these, from the empire that Britain was, was that England was making, all these influences were coming in. And you have, in America, the same kind of white hot language now. It's changing all the time. I really envy American novelists the American language. Uh, it is so, um, it's so inventive and it changes from, from day to day. You know? Whereas we're left with English and we have to try to, writers such as myself, we have to try to reinvigorate it from within. Because you know we, we we haven't got influences from outside. Lots of migrants come to English-speaking countries, but they don't have it. They learn the English that we speak. They don't. They don't contribute. You know, I have Romanian friends. I have French, German. They don't contribute to the English language in the way that they did in Elizabethan time and Shakespeare's time. But you guys are are are, are lucky. I mean, his style. Is so, uh, it's so rich. Uh, he writes this, this strange ki kind of um, 
I don't even know how to describe it. I've always been fascinated by it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dancing kind of language, which no other American writer does that. It dances along. It, it, it's quite elegant, and it's self-conscious, and it's, but it's still an absolutely an American language. Uh, and then in Canada, what I was sort of at first baffled by this. I thought, you know, how can he be writing so plainly? And I realized that he was doing the same thing, but in a different way. Um, so, you know, I, I do envy uh, you that, 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 that marvelous, uh, anyway, I've said it already, I, I envy American writing. But I don't think that, uh, as I say, I couldn't write in another language, so. I, I mean, when, Beck, when Beckett wrote in French, you know, he writes schoolboy French. Uh, and it, it's only when, it's only when he wrote in English that language came alive. There's a, sorry, I'm going on too long. I'll be very quick. Um, there's a wonderful passage in uh, Malloy, I think it is, where he says, morning is the time to hide. They wake up hale and hearty, their tongue baying for their due, their tongues hanging out for beauty, order, and justice. There's a wonderful canine image. That's not there in the French. Uh, it was only when he came to English, he came back to English, that, that the language comes alive. Sorry, I went down too long. Well, okay. well, that's interesting. I don't think I understood your question. Would you say that question again in another way? Because it, it interests me, and I don't think I have the slightest idea that I've addressed that question. Do, do you understand it? Choosing, writing novels is basically choosing words. And, and I'm curious how much you think about the way that it's not just grappling with language, but it's grappling with a particular language that has its own particular. You mean, you mean specific to your book or specific to the, the milieu, the, the language that of, of, your, of your culture or the language of your nation? What, 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 it's, the, it's the generalized sense that I don't understand. Probably most people, su such as John and I, are sort of hungry for language. So we're, we're sort of seeking language, looking for language. And, and, and wherever you can get it, you, f you, you use it if you, can, if you can make it make sense. So I, it's a kind of a, a difference that, that doesn't describe a, a distinction for, for, for me. Or maybe it's a distinction that doesn't describe a difference. Uh, I, I, I often think of my translators, you know, not when I'm writing, but afterwards. I, I think, my God, what are they going to make of this? And I, in one of my books, uh, The Infinities, a, a God is speaking, and he says, he's talking about how he and the gods are being coerced by mere human beings. And he says, fine gods we are that we must muster to a mortal must. Right? <laughs> and uh, I remember thinking, oh Christ. What are the poor translators going to make of this? And I asked one of them, and she said, I didn't notice that. <laughs> so obviously it's, it's, it's like when we were learning to read and you skip a hard word. Translators, when they come across a sentence like that, they say, can't do anything, and just <laughs> move on. Uh, but I was horrified, well, not horrified, I was slightly shocked that she, and she just finished translating the book. And I, you know, I, I thought, well, there are other sentences that are not quite as difficult. Did she skip them as well? <laughs> and did she just write her plain version of my book? Well you, well, you know what she did? She pans her tank right over it. She, yeah. just, she just transliterated it, probably. Yeah. And, and if, when that didn't make any sense, yeah. she put a sort of quietus yeah. to it by make, yeah. trying to make literal sense of it. But we can't worry about translations. I mean, you couldn't. No, we can't. You know, Nabokov used to get a Swedish dictionary and go through Swedish yeah. translations. Kevin, you had a question. Waste of time. Well, I'm just interested in your describing your, you describing your, um, you know, your writing in this way, and, and the suffering of having to turn and and, and find the path to, you know, walk by rejection and compromise and sort of happening in that in that particular sense. Like, 
You know my answer. What? You know my answer. <laughs> Did you hear the question? Well, as I understand it, no, it's, I don't know, Mike, you haven't got a mic. We're gifted with mics. As I understand it, you're saying, how does one regard the work at the end of the day or at the end of the book. And yourself in relationship to yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I, for my part, I stand baffled before it. I, I don't understand it. I don't. Um, when I read yesterday's work, I, I don't recognize it. I don't remember. Um, uh, somebody once showed me a an examination paper from schools in Ireland, and it had a piece of anonymous prose, and the student was required to comment on it. And the person said to me, what do you think of that? And I read it, and I vaguely familiar. I said, well, obviously I've read it. He said, no, 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 you wrote it. Uh, I'd completely forgotten it. Um, I, and this is, I don't know about you, but I, for me, it's, it's all past, it's gone. It's, it's, it doesn't really exist anymore. Even when you have to go back and read it again and, and make it better and... Oh, no, 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 no. I mean when it's published. Oh, when it's, it's published, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, right, of yeah. course I... Right. Right, that's, that's probably fairly accurate, too. I mean, my, my view, when you said, do you sometimes feel like you're sort of hanging on for dear life and some never? No, no, it's... it's, it's I'm, I'm whipping the mule as hard as I can whip it and, and trying to make it be a racehorse. This is what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's, I like that. Yeah, I'll steal that. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that in a review somewhere. And you say, that bastard. He's yes, so but, he, but, it, but it stayed a uh, mule, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, Anthony. Go ahead. Bellow. Of Saul Bellow. Um, well, I, I, I think Augie March is a wonderful book, in a way, one of the essential American books. I'm a, an American, Chicago born, um, mm. extraordinary energy. But I feel that Bellow's books are. They're strangely hard to remember because they're formless. Yeah, they are. They're like a, a somebody, maybe it was me, somebody <laughs> compared it to a, a, a section of a waterfall, you know? The water's come down and it's going on, and he's taken this one section out and it's fantastically powerful and moving, but it, it, it's formless. Um, and formlessness. Is form is is the thing that gives gives a work its its intensity and its memorableness. Horrible word, sorry. It's really late at night. I'm running out of uh, the language, but uh, but I do admire his 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 extraordinary energy and his risk and his and his his. Fearlessness, you know, he would be vulgar, he'd be trivial, he'd be, uh, he'll do whatever he thinks is needed. Uh, my 
kind of writer, and, and again, this is, I think, a difference in European and American writers, is that we'd be too scared to, to, to say the things that he does. And Martin Amos, who is a good friend of Bellows, Amos tried to do what Bellow did, but, and Martin's a good friend of mine. And I, anybody, none of this Twitter stuff, right? <laughs> Uh, please, uh, Martin is a very good friend of mine, and I wouldn't want him to. to but I, I, Martin's works are wonderful, but he, because he's European, he couldn't do the same kind of courageous formlessness. Sorry, that's the best answer I can do. Give. What do you think? I just thought Bella was great. I, you know, like, like, to, to me, he's. Since, since in a way, at least among American writers, since James, he's, he seemed to me to be the writer who had the greatest sense of, of mission of, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a novelist. I mean, he's, uh, for, for, for me. But I, and I completely subscribe to this notion of, 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 of the form not, not being his strong suit. But you know, when, when, when Updike died, um, Adam Gopnik wrote up. <coughs> in an obituary about Updike, he said that one of Updike's great accomplishments was that he got himself fully expressed. And, and, and what, that, what that meant to me was that everything that he thought was important, he got into the books that he wrote and found a form for them. And I think Bellow was probably somebody who got himself much more fully expressed than, than even John did. I thought he was, he was a munificent kind of writer, not not kind, not the least bit kind, um, but and so, it, but but but, the, but whatever unshapeliness th that those books achieved was his best effort at being generous and and, and kind. It, it just he just had it, he just met his limits, but he found his limits. He 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 he, he, he was working at his limits all the time. It mm -hmm. seemed to me. Well, we've yacked enough. Thank somebody you. wanted to, there was one more. Somebody wanted to ask a question, was it you? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Learn from a younger author? <laughs> <laughs> no, it really, really works the other way. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't think about things like that. I don't pick up a book and, you know, you, you, you'll think I'm evading your question, but I'm not. I mean, my, my basic belief is that literature's goal is to try to, if it can, display how we are more alike than unlike. And, and so when I pick up a book, I don't think I'm just about to read a book by a woman. I'm just about to read a book by a person of color. I mean, Paul Beatty, for instance, is a good, good example. You know, I, it, I don't mean to say that I'm colorblind. I'm not colorblind. I'll never be colorblind. I don't want to be colorblind. But um, I don't think to myself when I read a book by Paul Beatty, who's an African-American male, that I'm reading the African-American male book. I'm just reading a book that happens to be written by this person instead of that person. So there's, so there's not a... There's not a, a, a set of parameters into which his wisdom fits versus a set of parameters in which Alice Munro fits or mm -hmm. Joan Didion fits. It's, it's for me either useful or not useful. And, I, and I've been un unable to determine if r work by black writers or gay writers is any less useful to me than work written by John Banzo. Mm -hmm. you know, Generally speaking, wouldn't you wouldn't you want it that way? I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm browbeating you just a tiny bit, but but wouldn't you want it that way, as a as a reader and a person who might write a sentence herself? Take me on, take me on for what I write. Well, you can suppose that's a good answer, I think, because you because you're figuring it out. I think that's a, that's a good answer. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, if I understand you correctly, I'm, I'm androgynous when I, when I sit down to read. I don't care whether it's by a man or a woman, whether it's by a black person or a white person or a pink person or, you know, I just, I don't care. All I want is good writing. And I think that the best writing is the writing that has become as close to the impersonal, the impersonal as possible. Um, I think it's very dangerous at the moment. And, you know, you would probably think this is just two, two old guys, two old, old living white males. Uh, but I think that it, it is wrong to segregate art. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm one of those people, I, I don't see any difference between men and women apart from the obvious differences. Uh, I just, I don't, I never talk to women or I never talk to a black person or a Jewish person or a, differently to the way that I talk to, it, to an Irish Catholic like myself. Um, I'm not claiming some grand, you know, to, to, you know, I made myself this wonderful person of tolerance. This is simply the way it is. I don't regard literature, you know, it would be like saying, well, um, does one read Catullus differently to the way that one reads John Ashbery or something? You know, I, I don't. I mean, Catullus is as contemporary as 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 it, it, all uh, all art is. It lives in its own time, mm -hmm. and yeah. its own space, and its own color, and its own gender. Uh, it, it's it's it has to be distinct from from those. Um, from those concerns. Do you see what I mean? I'm sorry. So I, I I, I'm only sorry I in, in that I, I, I can't put it more succinctly, but I believe absolutely and passionately in this, that art has to be above these distinctions. Because otherwise it would become bogged down in, you know, talking about, you know, gay people or black people or, as I said, pink people or, you know, uh, Russians or... This is not how it is. All art transcends the moment and the circumstances of its production. Please. Yeah. About John, yeah. Uh, Adam, uh, 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 update. Yeah. And William Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do, do, do you mean that by that that maybe got me didn't get that right? Oh, I see. I see what you mean. What well, Updike said uh, that he hoped that, uh, I mean, I can't quote it, but he said that he hoped that when he finished the book that some kid in some Midwestern state would take it out of a library or buy it in a bookshop and be dazzled by it. Mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and he also said, I think it's one of the loveliest things, he said that his, his uh, project was to give the ordinary it's beautiful due. You'd say do. How do you say do? Do here. Do give it's beautiful due. You know, yeah. uh, which I think is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend.